So today's lecture will uh, deal with geovisualization and exploratory spatial data analysis. And there are three uh, major topics today. First, I'll give you some context about geovisualization, then some specific examples of what we call statistical maps, which are standard maps augmented with new devices, and then end with some illustration of exploratory data analysis, particularly the important concepts of linking and brushing. Geovisualization is how mapping is referred to uh, more recently. And going back to mapping itself, um, a map is really a way to present spatial objects. And as I mentioned in the introduction last time, there is a, a major distinction that has developed more recently between mapping as a way to present results and then geovisualization as part of the analysis itself where you interact with the data not just look at the pretty map as the result of an analysis and there are lots of things to keep in mind when you design a map and um, nowadays with point and click GIS's and cartographic uh, software in most instances you don't even think about it you just click on the default and out comes a map. And some packages have very good defaults, some packages have terrible defaults. There are all kinds of things to keep in mind when you design a map. And there is a, a famous little book by Mark Mamonier, How to Lie with Maps, which is a takeoff on this book on how to lie with statistics, which shows you how some of these design issues can give completely different impressions or perceptions of the information that's being transmitted. An important one um, is, for example, projection. You know, we talked a little bit about that last week. The way in which you turn the Earth as a globe into a flat map. Um, which country you put in the middle. Where you put the, um, the point of tangency for the projection, which will make certain countries look bigger than other countries whether or not they are actually bigger. And so in How to Lie with Maps and some other little books that he has on, on political maps, for example, you can see how that can be manipulated, for example, to make the enemy look more ominous than they really are by using a particular projection that makes their country look bigger or closer and, and th all those kinds of tricks. Uh, the reason why it's important to think about it is that um, the map is only part of the story. What really is happening is that we are looking at the map. We are perceiving things. We are summarizing a lot of information, shapes, colors, distances, and so on, that we are um, processing and uh, from which we derive certain perceptions. And if you know what you're doing, you can design the map so as to try to accomplish certain perceptions um, whether that's a good intention or a bad intention, the bottom line is you have to know what's involved in, in designing a map. Um, Geovisualization, as I mentioned, takes that a little further and actually exploits the fact that your cognition is involved in this process and combines the map with other scientific visualization methods. In other words, it incorporates the map and the mapping exercise as part of a larger scientific visualization exercise. And uh, scientific visualization is a whole collection of fairly modern techniques where the human capacity to detect patterns and to see things is exploited in the analysis. And, and this is very different from what we may be used to in the statistical analysis, which is like a black box, you know. Throw in the data, push on regression, and out comes the result. It's significant or it's not significant. A lot of modern problems are, in essence, too complex to be treated this way. So instead, you have a going back and forth between data collection, hypothesis generating, um, the creation of a model, that simulates what you think is the reality and then you look at what that model gives you. And there's some classic examples that you could see at NCSA about the structure of molecules, about how tornadoes form and change. Those are all mathematical models working in the background 
translating themselves into a picture or an animation which then allows the scientists to look back at this and see whether this actually matches with other observations or particular theoretical framework. So we bring the map into this exercise and the map as such is not sufficient. We augment the map with other devices and we'll see several examples of that later on in, in the lecture. Um, this geovisualization is part of what most recently one calls uh, visual analytics and the visual analytics are defined as the signs of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interfaces and where does this come from? Um, believe it or not, 9-11. After 9-11 there was this huge panic that um, US uh, various security agencies had enormous amounts of information. It is not a lack of information, but they didn't know what to do with it, or they didn't know how to analyze it. And one ways to tackle the one of the ways in which this problem can be tackled is by using what is now called visual analytics. The idea here is to be able to look at massive amounts of information very efficiently and to find and detect patterns. Now looking at this kind of information as some simple lists of numbers and numbers obviously is not going to do you any good. So the idea is to come up with um, devices, tools that allow you to very efficiently find things that are of interest in the data. And a lot of what we will be talking about today is about that. It's as vague as I put it. Finding interesting things. Oftentimes, you don't know what you're looking for. Okay, this is very different from what you might think of as, as scientific analysis might be. You have no idea what you're looking for, but you're looking for something that may give you a clue as to some process that may be going on or some uh, special characteristic of a particular phone call or a person or a purchase or some event that happened somewhere that you try to pick out of this mass of information. That's where a lot of this is coming from. Now this is not only about homeland security but it pertains to disease detection. Um, there's a, a major scare with the SARS epidemic and the potential of bird flu and all those things. Again, it's not a lack of information. There's tons of information but there's a, a lack of being able to deal with this in an efficient manner and to draw conclusions quickly from masses of information. So what we're looking at in visual analytics and, and in the class notes there's a link to the website of the center. Uh, this is the National Visualization and Anal Analysis Center. Is visual representation, how do you represent the data and how do you interact with the data? And the rest is pretty much common sense. I mean, you, you think about how people reason analytically by means of interacting with the data. How do you um, present the results? What kind of transformations do you need to do to the data to make them more um, analyzable? And how do you present the results? If you go to the website, you see a number of examples of this. In fact, they have a whole um, book about a research agenda for visual uh, analytics that you could just download. And you'll see some examples of, of visuals that they use to analyze. It's mostly in security settings, but with a little bit of imagination, you can transpose it to other research settings as well. And one of the things that um, I find kind of an interesting quote is it's all about detecting the expected. So you, you in a sense, find confirmation of what you thought should be there, but also discovering the unexpected. And that is what I mean by that you don't always look, know what you're looking for in these analyses. But you want some device, you want some way of representing the data so that you can actually see it. For example, something that comes out in a different color or some animation that starts bobbing up and down when something's going on and it gets your attention. Those are the kinds of things that because humans are actually incredible pattern detectors. They're able to uh, combine 
much more information very efficiently. Nobody really knows how it works, not yet anyway. But the, this capacity is there, and the idea of these visual an analytics is to provide you with tools that actually enhance this. So they have these decision rooms where you have all kinds of different maps and tables and graphs and things that move in front of you, and then based on that, presumably you're able to cut right to the chase and find what it is that you should be looking for in the first place. And all this effort, and there's a lot of resources behind this as well, are focused on policy actions. And, and recent examples where um, if it had been in place, and, and there were some partial applications of this are Katrina, for example, where you have some major natural disaster, there's all kinds of information about that area, how do you bring it together, and how do you quickly translate that in specific actions uh, that uh, pertain to the problem at hand. So I, I would suggest, if you're at all interested in, the, in this, check out this website and, and take a look at some of the examples. And this is a, a, a fascinating area that combines psychology, cognitive science, map design, computer science, uh, statistics, spatial statistics, and, and so on. It's very interdisciplinary. The basis for all this, and some of you may be familiar with this, is laid out in two books by Tufti about uh, dealing with visual explanation and dealing with some ground rules, some basic principles for graphical presentation. And there are a couple of other books along these lines where you get uh, examples of really bad graphs and excellent graphs. And there are a number of principles that are laid out in that book that they're actually kind of common sense, but you don't always think about it as you are uh, trying to present data graphically. And unfortunately, and this is one of the recurring gripes of the people working in this field, uh, standard software often violates some of these fundamental rules. And so they actually make you do bad things, like um, 3D graphs in a PowerPoint presentation. A 3D graph 3D bar chart is a terrible thing to portray gra uh, you know, um, quantitative information with. It should be a flat graph because the third dimension adds information to the graph that shouldn't be there. Because we're pattern recognizers, we take this depth cues that we get from, from the little bars and the little boxes and we translate them into different scales from what the original scale was. And that is something to avoid. And for example, this appropriate comparisons is something they keep hammering on. If you try to represent something, you have to make sure that the representation, the graphical representation, is in the same scale as the quantitative information that's behind it. You don't want to warp anything or distort something or exaggerate things uh, if that is not your purpose. Of course, if you're in the um, marketing business, you like to exaggerate things, and, and, and that's another story. But they're the same principles. And so, uh, very important here, something that we're stressing more and more, and um, uh, is metadata, documenting the sources of your information. And this actually transcends the analysis that we're talking about today, but more and more, the internet, the semantic web, is similar. It's documenting where the information comes from in such a manner that machines can actually figure out uh, where it came from. Uh, showing cause and effect and, and keeping in mind the multivariate nature of the problems. This is another thing that um, is often forgotten because maps tend to be univariate descriptions of the data, meaning they only look at one variable at a time. But that doesn't mean that that variable works in isolation works separate from other variables. In fact, typically we have a whole system of interacting phenomena, and if you just look at one of these in isolation, you can get a completely false picture of what is actually going on. So it's important to keep this in mind, and I'll stress this later on as well, that a lot of the things that we study and analyze are actually multivariate and not univariate. And the other bullet, which is very important, that's the sensitivity analysis, is to evaluate alternative explanations. 
one of the problems that we have in spatial data analysis, and we'll encounter that specifically when we start dealing with point pattern analysis and, and geostatistics, is that we only have one outcome. That's the particular pattern that we observe. But multiple processes might end up giving you the same outcome. So the problem is how to flip this around. It's how to deduce from the outcome that we perceive what process got us there. And this is what economists call an identification problem. And in many contexts in spatial data analysis, we're stuck. We, in fact, cannot flip the, pro flip the process around and identify uniquely, without ambiguity, which process gave us this particular outcome. Sometimes that's terrible. Sometimes it doesn't really matter that much. And we'll see as we go through the various methods. In exploratory analysis, it doesn't matter that much. At the end of the day, when you draw conclusions, it does matter a lot. And it's important to know how far you can or cannot go in, in this respect. So this gives you some um, lingo and some jargon of where these different techniques fit. Um, they fit into a, a fascinating new area of uh, research and development, which is referred to as visual analytics, and which has to do with how can you summarize, represent a lot of information visually so as to exploit the cognitive cap capabilities of, of the analyst.